Chapter 10 Robert Kennedy, whose summer home is eight miles from the home I live in all year round, was shot two nights ago. He died last night. So it goes. Martin Luther King was shot a month ago. He died, too. So it goes. And every day my government gives me a count of corpses created by military science in Vietnam. So it goes. My father died many years ago now, of natural causes. So it goes. He was a sweet man. He was a gun nut, too. He left me his guns. They rust. On Trafamador, says Billy Pilgrim, there isn't much interest in Jesus Christ. The earthling figure who is most engaging to the Trafamadorian mind, he says, is Charles Darwin, who taught that those who die are meant to die, that corpses are improvements. So it goes. The same general idea appears in The Big Board by Kilgore Trout. The flying saucer creatures who capture Kilgore Trout's hero ask him about Darwin. They also ask him about golf. If what Billy Pilgrim learned from the Trafamadorians is true, that we will all live forever, no matter how dead we may sometimes seem to be, I am not overjoyed. Still, if I am going to spend eternity visiting this moment and that, I am grateful that so many of those moments are nice. One of the nicest ones in recent time was on my trip back to Dresden with my old war buddy, O'Hare. We took a Hungarian Airlines plane from East Berlin. The pilot had a handlebar mustache. He looked like Adolf Menjou. He smoked a Cuban cigar while the plane was being fueled. When we took off, there was no talk of fastening seatbelts. When we were up in the air, a young steward served us rye bread and salami and butter and cheese and white wine. The folding tray in front of me would not open out. The steward went into the cockpit for a tool, came back with a beer can opener. He used it to pry out the tray. There were only six other passengers. They spoke many languages. They were having nice times, too. East Germany was down below, and the lights were on. I imagined dropping bombs on those lights, those villages and cities and towns. O'Hare and I never expected to make any money, and... Here we are now, extremely well-to-do. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, I said to him lazily, just ask for Wild Bob. O'Hare had a little notebook with him, and printed in the back of it were postal rates and airline distances and the altitudes of famous mountains and other key facts about the world. He was looking up the population of Dresden, which wasn't in the notebook, when he came across this, which he gave me to read. On an average, 324,000 new babies are born into the world every day. During that same day, 10,000 persons, on average, will have starved to death or died from malnutrition. So it goes. In addition, 123,000 persons will die for other reasons. So it goes. This leaves a net gain of about 191,000 each day in the world. The Population Reference Bureau predicts that the world's total population will double to 7 billion before the year 2000. I suppose they will all want dignity, I said. I suppose, said O'Hare. Billy Pilgrim was meanwhile traveling back to Dresden, too, but not in the present. He was going back there in 1945, two days after the city was destroyed. Now Billy and the rest were being marched up into the ruins by their guards. I was there. O'Hare was there. We had spent the last two nights in the blind innkeeper's stable. Authorities had found us there. They told us what to do. We were to borrow picks and shovels and crowbars and wheelbarrows from our neighbors. We were to march with these implements to such and such a place in the ruins, ready to go to work. There were barricades on the main road leading into the ruins. Germans were stopped there. They were not permitted to explore the moon. Prisoners of war from many lands came together that morning at such and such a place in Dresden. It had been decreed that here was where the digging for bodies was to begin, so the digging began. Billy found himself paired as a digger with a Maori who had been captured at Tobruk. The Maori was chocolate brown. He had whirlpools tattooed on his forehead and his cheeks. Billy and the Maori dug into the inert, unpromising gravel of the moon. The materials were loose, so there was a constant little avalanche. Many holes were dug at once. Nobody knew yet what there was to find. 
Many holes came to nothing, to pavement, or to boulders so huge they would not move. There was no machinery. Not even horses or mules or oxen could cross the moonscape. And Billy and the Maori, and the others helping them with their particular hole, came at last to a membrane of timbers laced over rocks which had wedged together to form an accidental dome. They made a hole in the membrane. There was darkness and space under there. A German soldier with a flashlight went down into the darkness and was gone a long time. When he finally came back, he told a superior on the rim of the hole that there were dozens of bodies down there. They were sitting on benches. They were unmarked. So it goes. The superior said that the opening in the membrane should be enlarged and that a ladder should be put in the hole so that the bodies could be carried out. Thus began the first corpse mine in Dresden. There were hundreds of corpse mines operating by and by. They didn't smell bad at first, or wax museums, but then the bodies rotted and liquefied, and the stink was like roses and mustard gas. So it goes. The Maori Billy had worked with died of the dry heaves after having been ordered to go down into that stink and work. He tore himself to pieces, throwing up and throwing up. So it goes. So a new technique was devised. Bodies weren't brought up any more. They were cremated by soldiers with flamethrowers right where they were. The soldiers stood outside the shelters, simply sent the fire in. Somewhere in there, the poor old high school teacher, Edgar Derby, was caught with a teapot he had taken from the catacombs. He was arrested for plundering. He was tried and shot. So it goes. And somewhere in there was springtime. The corpse mines were closed down. The soldiers all left to fight the Russians. In the suburbs, the women and children dug rifle pits. Billy and the rest of his group were locked up in the stable to, in the suburbs. And then, one morning, they got up to discover that the door was unlocked. World War II in Europe was over. Billy and the rest wandered out into the shady street. The trees were leafing out. There was nothing going on out there, no traffic of any kind. There was only one vehicle, an abandoned wagon drawn by two horses. The wagon was green and coffin-shaped. Birds were talking. One bird said to Billy Pilgrim, Pootie-wheat? <laughs>